Now, aside from just describing a distribution using one variable, that is birth weight, intelligence, reaction time, we can also start to look at the distributions of two variables. And that's when we look at correlations. So correlation now, when we're looking at the x-axis um, and y-axis, they mean different things. For a histogram or a frequency distribution, the y-axis meant frequency. It no longer means frequency in a correlation or in the number of scores. In an x-axis, uh, in a correlation, the x-axis refers to our predictor variable, and the y-axis or the vertical axis refers to our outcome variable. And this is showing the relation between two variables. So each dot on a scatter plot or a correlation chart represents each case in your study. So for this chart, let's say x-axis was uh, height and y-axis was weight. We know people of shorter stature may weigh less. We know people of higher stature because they have more bones and more tissue, uh, they weigh, may weigh more. So we would see a bit of a pattern here in our correlation. In correlations, what we want to do is see how scores in y change as scores in x increase. So as, uh, as height increases, weight also increases on this chart. So that's telling us there's an association or a link between x and y. As x changes, so does y, and y changes in a predictable way. So that's important for us to acknowledge. So in correlations, we start to understand that there's two distributions that seem linked. So when we go to measure correlations, there's two types of measurements we're interested in. We're looking at the direction, and we're also looking at the strength. So for directions, we're interested in positive and negative, as well as a lack of a correlation. So in a positive correlation, what we often see is as x increases, y increases. So it will go up um, with the lower left corner and the upper right corner showing a bit of a diagonal. Probably should do it the other way. And then with a negative correlation, as x increases, y decreases. So it will be as x, it would be the upper uh, left corner and the lower right corner. Something would be a negative correlation uh, could be something like the amount you've driven your car and the amount of gas in the tank. So when you first start off with a full tank, you haven't driven far, but as you drive further, there's less and less gasoline in your tank. That would be a negative correlation. A negative correlation is not a bad thing, it's just called negative because there's an inverse relation. As x increases, y decreases. That's why we call it negative. It's not a lack of a correlation. A lack of a correlation is actually something where there's no pattern. As x increases, there's no pattern or change in y. Sometimes it's just too complicated and sometimes y is just a straight line. This could be something like uh, the number of fingers you have and your age. It doesn't seem, may, maybe a few people lose fingers as they go, but it's not too commonplace. So then it would just look like a flat, a flat line. In addition to the direction, we're also interested in the magnitude. How we tend to measure magnitude of correlation is through a statistic called the Pearson's R. And Pearson's R, uh, broadly speaking, tends to man, uh, measure the squish or spread of the dots. And so the squish or spread of the dots tells us the strength of the correlation. And so uh, what we see down here in this chart is if there's no correlation, if there just seems to be completely random, our Pearson's R is zero. And an, a Pearson's R of zero means there's no correlation whatsoever. If there's a slight correlation, if we start to see a lack of dots in, let's say, the upper left and the lower right corners, uh, as you can see um, in, in the middle, middle uh, picture here, that starts to be a slight correlation. And that's a picture of a Pearson's R at 0.3 in the positive direction. We also get 0.3 in the negative direction where the opposite corners would be empty. As the dots begin to get closer and closer together, the Pearson's R increases to 0.6. And then we can see down the bottom row it increases to 0 0.75, 0 0.9. And then what we would call a perfect correlation would be a Pearson's R of 1. It's important to note we can also get a perfect negative one, and that would again look like a perfect straight line from the upper left corner to the lower right corner, the exact opposite of what we're seeing here. A negative one correlation is an extremely strong correlation, and a positive one correlation is an extremely strong correlation, but a zero is a perfectly weak correlation. So it's important to understand that it's, 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 it goes in both directions, and so magnitude is the absolute magnitude, and direction just tells us if it's an inverse relation or a positive relation. Now, in terms of when we go to interpret correlations, there are some pitfalls that people tend to fall into. It's important to understand that correlations can only be interpreted at the group level and not for individuals. 
Imagine if we just plot someone's uh, height versus weight on a chart and there's no one else on the chart. It doesn't tell us anything. It's just one dot. We can't see a pattern. We can't tell how squished or spread out the dots are. We can't tell if, it's, if Y is increasing in response to X. It doesn't make sense. Another major pitfall people fall into with this, we already mentioned, was that correlation does not imply causation. So it's important to understand this is descriptive and not inferential. We're only describing there's an association here and we're not saying there's a cause and an effect. For instance, let's say people eat more ice cream in the summer and people also witness more thunderstorms in the summer. Does eating ice cream cause thunderstorms? Does thunderstorms cause eating ice cream? It's hard to say. What we're actually finding is there's probably an extraneous variable here, of course, heat and change in temperature in the northern ha uh, hemisphere is causing people to want more ice cream and also that change in, in temperature is also causing the thunderstorms. But if we're just measuring ice cream usage and thunderstorm witnessing, there's no causal link there. There's no cause and effect between those two variables. Another one would be, let's say, uh, somebody says, I wish they'd stop putting on the uh, seatbelt light in a car, uh, or a seatbelt light in an airplane, rather, because every time they turn on the seatbelt light, uh, it gets really shaky. Obviously, the seatbelt light is not what's causing the turbulence on an airplane. That's not the cause to the effect. Um, it is the turbulence that's causing the pilot to put on the seatbelt light, and it's also causing it to shake. And so that could be causal, but in the opposite direction. The shaking is causing the seatbelt light. The seatbelt light's not causing the shaking. And so it's important for us to tease that apart. But depending on how you measure the variables in your study, you may not be ready to assume that. Let's say we find out that anxious children do more poorly in school. Well, is there a cause and effect there? Do they do more poorly because they're anxious? Or are they more anxious because they perform poorly? We can't really tell based on a correlation. And so we have to tease that apart with other things. And that brings in the reason for inferential statistics. So with inferential statistics, what we're interested in here is explaining the numbers. We're moving past just describing the numbers now, and we want to explain it. And some of the ways inferential statistics help to explain the numbers is through things like estimating the population. We only have the numbers for our sample, but we can estimate if these are representative or commonplace in the population. So do we think that people in our reaction time measure represent everyone else? And if so, um, what does that say? We can also use inferential statistics to make predictions. Does the IV actually predict the DV? Does the independent variable predict the dependent variable? Or is this not? This is kind of building on uh, correlations, but going a step further. And finally, a big part of inferential statistics is evaluating probabilities and testing our hypothesis. So what are the chances of finding that effect? So let's go into this a little bit further. So for probability, we found out already that the curves in most human characteristics are a normal curve with tails. Most people scoring in the center, about 70% of people being one interval off of the mean. And we also find that less than 1% are in either one of the tails. And so we have to think about how we're measuring things. Imagine we wanted to measure the probability of rolling a four with dice. But let's say you're only starting with one die. The probability of rolling a four with one die, six-sided die, is not weighted, it's not a trick die. Well, you're going to have equal probabilities of all the six sides. So four is going to be a pretty commonplace score to roll. Now let's imagine you're rolling with two die. And then what we're going to find is you can still roll a four pretty readily. You're going to roll more sevens than anything else on average, but you can get a four pretty easily. Now let's try and roll a four with three die. And this is where all the sides of the dice need to add up to four. What you're going to find is you're going to get a lot of 10, 11, 12s. Fours are still possible, but now they're increasingly towards the tail end of the distribution, which means they're a rarer score. And then finally, try to take four dice and roll it so each dice is facing with the one up, so that your total score is four. You're going to find this nearly impossible. You might be rolling all day long. In fact, you're going to see so many 14s and 15s, you're going to be sick of it. And the 4s and the 24s are going to become a lot more rare. So something that was commonplace with one dice is going to become rare overall. This is why it's important for us to get lots of people in our study. If we only measure somebody's intelligence or reaction time or personality with a small sample size, uh, it's going to seem like something's really commonplace. But if we measure with lots of people, we're going to find that to be increasingly, increasingly rare. Okay.
And so that's what we're looking for. It's important to understand that getting at the tail end of the curve is very exceptionally rare to get. And so this is how we can start to evaluate if our sample is representative of the population. If we look at what a population curve should look like, let's say let's say this is this is sort of what people should get, and we start rolling a bunch of numbers that are very unique, that tells us our sample is pretty unique and not too generalizable. In terms of testing these probabilities and testing our hypothesis, well then what we do, let's say we're comparing people who drove under the influence of cannabis and people who didn't drive under the influence of cannabis, and we look at the number of driving infractions. And let's look up here to the yellow and red curves. What we find in one image, the red and yellow curves overlap quite a lot, and in the other one they don't overlap at all, or very little. What we could find is, let's say, let's say the driving infractions uh, is, is, the, is the curves, and the red shows the people under the influence of cannabis, and the yellow shows the people that were sober. And the horizontal is the number of driving uh, collisions. What we find in the top image is certainly the average person under the influence of cannabis scored higher than the average person who was sober, but that's not the numbers we use. We have to look at the distributions and the overlap of the distributions. And what we're finding is the blue area is quite large. This means the chances uh, are actually quite high. We actually see a lot of people in the red that are scoring lower than the average yellow, and a lot of people in yellow scoring higher than the average red. And therefore, we would say that there might be a measurable difference between those two distributions, but the difference is not significant. That is, the difference we have measured may be due to chance, and chance alone. It might be a fluke. It may be an anomaly. Versus the lower chart is showing a smaller blue area. And what we can see here is the only overlap between the yellow and red curves are just the very tails of the curve. And getting to those tails of the curve is very rare. And if the overlap is small enough, we say there is a significant difference between the red curve and the yellow curve, and therefore there's a significant difference in the number of driving collisions experienced by those under the influence of cannabis and those not under the influence of cannabis. This is why we simply don't take the averages and we just simply read the averages. Imagine if we did an IQ test, and it was an IQ test we only did on eight children, and we did it on four girls and four boys, and we can see their scores here. We can see that a girl scored the highest score, she earned 135 on intelligence. We can see the boy scored the lowest score, he had a 92, which is still very average and very good. And if we were to take the average for girls, uh, it would be higher than the average for boys, but most likely the distributions would greatly overlap and we would not be able to say that there was significant difference. So when we go back to hypothesis testing, it's important to understand we're interested in the probability that the differences exist by chance or that they exist based on a manipulation of the independent variable or differences in the independent variable. So we want to rule out that it's done by chance or done by error. And so that's where we're going with the inferential statistics. So now we've covered most of the bases. The last really brief section is just on how we report our scientific findings in psychology. And so for most psychological studies uh, in North America, we rely on the American Psychological Association or the APA rule book for how to write up our psychological studies. Please note I have imaged here uh, the sixth edition. We're now in the seventh edition, but that's okay. And so this APA rule book tells us exactly how to write up our studies. It tells us rules for grammar, and the grammar rules can be quite strict. And particularly, as compared to other disciplines like philosophy or anthropology, psychology really promotes and prioritizes short, active sentences that are not flowery, that don't have metaphors, uh, that don't have uh, beautiful prose, just short scientific sentences. Uh, there is some debate in psychology whether or not we like Oxford commas. I prefer Oxford commas myself. Uh, but the, the rule book also gives us guidelines about parallelism and dangling modifiers. And if you are not well versed on your English grammar rules, it's a great place to start. It also tells us a lot about formatting, how to format the headers and the headlines and the margins and the font uh, on our manuscripts. So if you're ever doing a written essay for psychology, this will tell you exactly how to format it. Uh, no, don't submit your paper with a colorful cover page of Comic Sans uh, that unless your instructor uh, explicitly requests that. It also gives you guidelines for if you have tables or figures in your report, uh, how, to, how to manage your columns or captions. And it also tells us some things about writing style, about the use of third person versus first person, and it does mandate uh, political correctness. So for instance, we now say people with depression, we do not say depressives. 
Uh, we say people with mental illness. We don't say those who are mentally sick. Uh, and so there's certain things that you can look to in there and we try to keep it updated so it is gender inclusive uh, and, and try to make sure it is up to date as possible. So thanks very much for joining me on this tour through research methods in intro psychology. You've made it to the end of unit two.